installment of the Forlorn Dopes has started. Hello everyone and good evening. I hope you're all well. Uh, welcome to our little show. I am your host, Cyber Smiley. I am your co-host, uh, Wisdom000. Zero, zero, zero. And uh, yeah, we've got a great show lined up for you guys yeah. today. Um, yeah, so uh, right before we get into the whole uh, spiel, um, just a quick note, I believe patch 2.0 for Cyberpunk 2077 is dropping today. Um, so if you are already playing it or already downloading it, good job. I know I still have a bit of time before I can get into it. Um, but to go on to our show, we are graciously uh, um, being... Uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, having a wonderful guest, we, we are we are we are being joined today by uh, Mike Jackson, yes, uh, Emmy Award winning uh, filmmaker, Only nominated, and, sadly, but uh, okay, Emmy nominated filmmaker and uh, artist for Our Talsorian, as well as many other absolutely classic games. Um, we'll 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 be getting into that here in just a moment but moment but first we've got to update on some things um in 2020 news longtime webmaster uh, who had disappeared for a while dimiscule is is back he's got a let me see if i can find his address his new uh website address uh if you just type in dimiscule it'll, it should pop up but um yeah he posted a, a reddit post in the uh, cyberpunk 2020 uh, thread recently indeed so just take a moment i meant to have this queued up but i got excited when, when mike joined the <laughs> discord for us so uh... yeah so here um... we go his new site is at cyberpunk.clone01.net uh, so check it out it's a fantastic site tons of stuff on there um, we're very glad to have him back in the community definitely um, a friend of the show and uh, cyberpunk 2020 writer Ross Wynn Ross uh, I know you're going through some tragedy right now Yep. I don't want to get into details and air your air, air your air your story, uh, but just just know that our hearts are with you. And uh, if you need anything that we can help with, pal, don't hesitate to reach out. Yep. Even though our hearts might be decentralized because we took that cyber option, but um, <laughs> we do we do uh, pay center two thousand. Send our condolences. But uh, we'll move on. Um, Mike, welcome to the show, man. No, oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Um, oh, one thing that I, I yeah. neglected to ask beforehand. Uh, so we usually do about a two hour show. Um, if you need to leave, cut out early, just let us know and we'll kind of wrap it up and, um, we'll let you go. But just, just to give you kind yeah, of a well, ballpark. <laughs> Okay, cool. I'm I am still recovering from COVID, so uh, I'll hang on as long as I can. I think I should be able to make it all the way through, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Awesome, excellent. Well, uh, I mean, Mike, we we've been looking forward to having you on for a while, so we're we're very excited to have you here today. Uh, just as you know, a brief recap um, for the audience at home. You worked on, uh, for our Talsorian games, you worked on Firestorm Shockwave, Listen Up You Primitive Screwheads, Maximum Metal, Night City, uh, Pacific Rim, Solo of Fortune, Eurosource, and you did articles for uh, art for the uh, Challenge Magazine articles. Um, mm -hmm. In addition, uh, you worked for, you, you did illustration for Battletech, Shadowrun, Traveler, Renegade Legion, Star Wars by West End Games, the, the most definitive, best Star Wars RPG they they put out, and Torg. Mm -hmm. You That's also uh, did. Exhaustive list. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
we tried to do a little bit of, re or I tried to do a little bit of uh, research on uh, what you've done, and I was impressed, <laughs> to say the least, when I started going down <laughs> that rabbit hole. You also did storyboard and concept work for Aeon Flux, Reboot, Kim Possible, and others. Uh, you did a web co comic called Apart Mageddon. And you have been the writer, director, uh, editor of several short films, and you're making your first feature-length movie right now, right? Yeah, yeah. My, uh, my, my day job for the last many years has been mostly as a film editor. Uh, I occasionally get to direct music videos and shorts and things, uh, but I mostly edit other people's films. But yeah, my first feature, uh, a time travel comedy called Time Helmet, where getting dangerously close to finishing. Awesome. Knock on wood. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I've done editing work myself. That is, that is a, that is a, a tedious, uh, not tedious, but it, it is a time consuming job that, uh, but it makes, makes the movie or project or whatever you're doing. Like you bring it all together. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So before it's, we, uh, uh, go ahead finish your thought i'm sorry oh no that's fine um so before we get fully into the whole interview we have a questionnaire we ask all our guests um quick answers quick questions uh hopefully uh <laughs> we i always say there's always there's no wrong answers except one of the questions but i think you know um from your your credentials it might be a a question that's debatable on whether it's uh it, it, there's a right answer. <laughs> so, uh, so first question. Twenty. Uh, scared. <laughs> so first question is twenty twenty, twenty forty five, or twenty seventy seven. Oh, I enjoy twenty twenty and twenty seventy seven. Never played the middle one. Okay. Uh, your favorite Excellent. cyberpunk role slash career. Solo. It was always solo. Okay. Uh, favorite piece of cyberware? Oh, oh man, it's been so many years. Uh, can it be from either uh, from the games or? Yeah, anywhere. It can be from anything. Or, or like from it. Uh, uh, Cyberpunk 2077, I've got to say, uh, I really enjoyed me the uh, Gorilla Arms. Yeah, nice. It's, it's yeah. nothing fancy, but those were. Every time I got to rip open a door, it felt good. <laughs> Hitting somebody and watching them fly across the room. That's, oh, yeah. That's well, yeah, so the first, very the first time I smacked someone hard like that, it was just a wonderful moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, favorite cyberpunk weapon? Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to go with 2077 because in general, the or 2020, it's it was all just real-world guns. Um... 2077 uh comrades hammer once i got that i was like having a hard time in in all fights up until i got comrades a really good role on comrades hammer um or whatever not not the that's the legendary one the non-legendary version of it whatever they call the bar, it yeah. but yeah once i could start blow uh popping heads through walls with that thing it was a game changer it's yeah <laughs> it's a great way to relieve frustration. Uh, favorite Cyberpunk 2020 book? Old black, no art, <laughs> or almost no art. The simple set of books in the box. Right. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Uh, least favorite. I, I, oh, go ahead. If you can finish that thought. Oh, I was just going to say, it, it's... It was a last gasp of cheap, simple games for RPGs. It's like after that, every game started having like these big, lush art books, like um, yeah, like Shadowrun and and BattleTech did and stuff. But but yeah, it's like I really like just that that clean little elegance, and I got so much fun out of just playing that basic original version of the game. Yeah, it was. I just, mean the. The 2013 box set is, you're right, it was it was the peak of do-it-yourself, you know, publishing. Um, and it's, it's a great little time capsule to go back and recapture that 
that period of gaming where that kind of thing was allowed where where it was yeah yep totally totally least favorite cyberpunk book uh i can't answer because i have not kept up with all cyberpunk <laughs> materials um i could say i am i'm least happy with uh and forgive me because that title some of the titles escape me now because i did so much art for so many books whichever book it was where i had to do like 20 illustrations of vehicles okay. max metal max metal yeah um i but it's like i'm disappointed with myself because it was a tight deadline and i said i could do it and i ran out of time and so that's why it was all pencil scans and you could do that today today you can reproduce pencil art beautifully uh in in books and comics they do it all the time but back then it just it, it ended up looking so bad and so that's that's my least favorite cyberpunk book <laughs> okay. okay well we are definitely going to swing back to max metal um but that that is definitely that is an interesting answer i would not have expected that okay next, i am to please next question pan am uh judy or rogue Um, Judy. Okay. Uh, okay. Lucy, Rebecca, or Kiwi? This is from uh, Edge Runners. Oh. Okay. Which one was? Which one was the the tiny girl with Rebecca. the pigtails who got the giant robot Rebecca. arms? Yeah. Rebecca. There we go. Okay. Or as I call her, Rebaka, because she becomes Adam Smasher's shoes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Carrie, Ouch. Carrie River or Goru? <sighs> Carrie is, of course, Carrie Uridine. River is the uh, cop. police cop. And uh, Goro oh. is, you know, the cool Arasaka assassin. I... I banged all of them in the in the game with my in one of my Facebook accounts. Like, uh, they're, they're, yeah, they they none of them were keepers. Okay. All right. Um, David, who is the main character, Maine, who is his tutorial, and uh, Pillar, who is like the crazy tech from Edge Runners. From Edge Runners. Say that again. David Maine. David or Pillar, the main character. Mm hmm. Maine, who was like the mentor, like leader of the of the little group, mm. and Pilar, who was like the techies, like the first one to die. Maine. Okay. There we go. Uh, favorite Night City gang. Huh. I don't really have favorites. They're all kind of irritating. <laughs> That makes sense. And and I'm honestly I'm blanking on the names of any of them from either the original game or the uh, uh, or 2077. No worries. Uh, favorite Megacorp. Arasaka. There you go. Always hey, hey. Arasaka. Indeed. And this is a, a general question out of the genre. So, what's your favorite cyberpunk movie? Huh. Well, the easy answer is Blade Runner because it <clears throat> it did it all and it did it all first. So much of what we imagine when we think of cyberpunk comes from that movie. Absolutely, um, and it's it is a masterpiece for good reason. Uh, oddly enough. And I don't think a lot of people think of it that way. Um, and so few people saw it. Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise. You know, that's a pretty underrated movie. I, I, that's, that's the first time we've had somebody uh, claim that to be their favorite cyberpunk movie, but it, that's perfectly valid in my eyes. It is. Uh, next question is favorite cyberpunk fictional character. Hmm. 
Molly Millions. Nice. There we go. Uh, Gibson, Dick, or uh, Stevenson? <laughs> That's a, a good trio. Um, so much to love from all three of them. Uh, Gibson stuff I found first. So I'll say Gibson. Plus, I've managed to. Uh, he lives in the same city as me. So back uh, back in the '90s, he used to go go to science fiction conventions a lot. So I've had drinks with with Bill Gibson. Oh, uh, oh nice! Awesome. Um, Favorite cyberpunk novel? Hmm. Oh, I wish Nielsen, uh, 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 yeah, I wish Neil Stevenson could stick the landing because half you know, that's, of Snow Crash That's the perfect is, way to put that, yeah. Half of Snow Crash is fantastic. Um, but, uh, he's I like think Stephen I'll... King and Mel Brooks. He just can't, he can't do <laughs> endings. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll just go with Neuromancer, to be honest. Okay. Like, it really did. Again, it, it was the first, and it, it just cracked open so much. And then the final question. It, it, it is indeed the book that opened the floodgates. And the final question, which is uh, controversial, uh, is Shadowrun <laughs> cyberpunk? Well, I can see why it's a controversial question, because there isn't a clear answer. It's cyberpunk with elves and magic. And so it definitely has many of the trappings of cyberpunk, and that's why I enjoyed doing Shadowrun illustrations for the books. Um, and the magical stuff's fun to draw. But if... It, yeah, it all go, comes down to your personal definition of cyberpunk. If what gives the deepest meaning to you of it is hardcore tech a hard science um this could all really work with the right technology uh realism gritty um yeah if that if if hard science is important for you um and shadow run sure isn't it um that's a, i think that's that's the a great best answer. answer i've I was, had i, I was <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, I always refer to Shadowrun and things like that as being cyberpunk adjacent rather than true cyberpunk. Uh, but that, that I think that probably sums it up better than anything I've ever said. Yeah, I, I view, um, I mainly view Shadowrun as kind of urban fantasy um, more than it is cyberpunk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's... Yeah, it, it's such a strange turducken of a of a game world that that, that they built. With. <laughs> so it is part of many genres and no and no genres. It's cyberpunk and it's fantasy, and it's uh, yeah urban and yeah it's got a whole bunch of things all mixed in together. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, version. it's it's like if you read the books, it's D and D with guns but if you look at the art it's cyberpunk with magic yep yep that's a good way to put it yeah so, so that's the questionnaire so mike and, what have you been up yeah now it's just uh yeah. us getting into the interview man yeah so what have you been up to lately uh i mentioned that you're you're in filmmaking so can you give us some more detail on that uh yeah yeah basically i mean I illustration was kind of my first career and I basically did that through the nineties and, uh, it tapered off, uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, the money was just not good. It's really hard to make rent, uh, doing illustrations. Um, and so I moved into video games, um, and I worked in the video game industry for a few years, uh, and then, then slid into film. Uh, and yeah, started out doing storyboards for Aeon Flux, uh, and did concept art on Reboot Season 3, um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and yeah, I, uh, over the years I've, yeah, I've, I've edited a lot of 
documentaries, a few features, uh, and, uh, and directed, uh, a whole lot of music videos and shorts. And then, yeah, Time Helmet is, uh, is my first feature, uh, and hopefully it will get finished and out there soon. Uh, it's being done on a ultra, ultra low budget, so, uh, when you don't have time, uh, when you don't have money, it takes time. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I've been... yeah, no, I, I, I very much understand that. I used to, when I lived in Kansas city, I, uh, I worked with like a zero budget film company called trust and us productions. Uh, we made zero budget. I'm talking, we had nothing, but, uh, it's a, it's a time consuming process. That is, if you're not doing it out of love, you're not doing it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and some of the <clears> uh, <throat> visuals I've seen from uh, Time Helmet, it it looks like a decent uh, filmed movie compared to some of the low budget movies we I've seen, even recent ones. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks it, it it looks better than its budget would allow. So kudos on that. I cannot wait to see it. Awesome. Well, thank you. That's uh, that is wonderful to hear uh because because yeah you have to cut a lot of corners and things uh, and uh so yeah so it's uh, we worked really hard had a huge incredible team behind me on it and uh and they all put in just all that extra the the extra effort it takes to just try to make things sing um yeah yeah, yeah so um how or when and how did you get in to become an illustrator for uh, tabletop RPGs in the beginning, back in the nineties. Oh, well, that actually even started at the end of the eighties. Um, <clears throat> the way back before the internet, uh, there weren't a lot of ways that fans of games communicated. Um, but I was really into like the first role playing game I played was Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and then, uh, I found Traveler, which I just totally fell in love with. Um, and back in my teens, I basically, I started a fanzine for Traveler and I wrote little adventures and new pieces of equipment and lore. And I did all the illustrations myself. Um, and there were a whole bunch of us doing these, mailing our little fanzines back and forth, um and uh kind of growing the community the game community uh and i did i got successful enough with that crappy little fanzine um that i got noticed by digest group who had kind of taken over publishing traveler stuff Mm -hmm. um and they gave me my first uh, I sold my first article to them. I can't remember what it was. Something about high-tech healing or something like that. And they uh, they offered me the chance to do illustrations for stuff, which I jumped at. And uh, once I started drawing all the time, I got a lot better fast. So it's kind of terrifying. Like the stuff that I was drawing at that at like 19 was so so bad i'm amazed they wanted to print it um but within a year i was so much better and i was starting to do uh stuff for and and yeah i think uh it wasn't long after um i uh hang on i no apologize worries. no problem for that. you're fine um but uh but yeah and i also like yeah Traveler was the first role-playing game I fell in love with, but a few years later, Cyberpunk came out, and that just blew me away. That was, like, hands down, immediately, it was the greatest role-playing game I had ever played. It was everything I was looking for. I was so deep into Bill Gibson and stuff like that back then. Uh, And uh, the anime that you could get, like Akira, uh, that uh, was just starting to come over. Uh, anyway, long story short, so so I started working just on a game I already loved, and then I think I just sent some samples to our Talsorian Games. It was like, I want to work on Cyberpunk. There, I, I love that game, and they gave this teenager a shot, and I started drawing for them. Awesome. Yeah, I gotta tell you. 
I mean, uh, they didn't pay very much, so. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, uh, like, I, I've said it many times. Like, you, Chris Hockabout, and Benjamin Wright are my three favorite artists to ever work on uh, to ever work on the cyberpunk franchise and in fact you gave me my 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 favorite piece of cyberpunk art in the entire franchise and that is on uh just one second uh so i can look up the page number page 95 of the night city source book it's the it's the full page shot from above the city with the police av coming down mm. It's it is my favorite piece of cyberpunk art. It, it encapsulates what I want my night city to look like, um, and I I just love this piece of art. But what has always gotten me about this piece of art is if you look at it and then look at the source book, like everything is in the proper place, and the buildings yeah. are in the proper shape. The, <laughs> Did you do the art first and then they wrote the source book around that or was it the other way around? I think they gave me the map. Okay. Like it it just always blew me away. And that's that's the thing about your art is it's always the three of you did the did something that up until that point I'd never actually seen done in in RPGs. In that your art is consistent across the board. If you draw an AV4 in this picture and then draw one in a later picture it looks the same the same vehicle <laughs> there might be minor like modifications like this one might have a gatling gun or this one might have missiles but it's the same vehicle and it's obvious that it's the same vehicle you can instantly recognize it mm. um and that just that amazed me as a kid plus it it just comes across as being so Okay, what got me into cyberpunk, uh, the role-playing game, was I was a huge fan of Appleseed and Bubblegum Crisis mm. and, like, these highly technical uh, animes where, you know, the tech all looked real and you could feel it. Yeah. Uh, and then I'd avoided role-playing games until, you know, a friend of mine at the Art Institute in Kansas City invited me to come see it or to come play with them. And just, I immediately fell in love with the game. And your art just evoked every last bit of that love and that, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it was, it, it felt very much like anime on a page. Well, I, I did have, it's funny because that was so like these days, like every second young person draws like anime, but back then no one did that. No, uh, no I, one did. I didn't draw people anime I, I i dabbled with a little bit but it, it didn't look right when i drew it but yeah i the <clears throat> when at university a friend handed me uh, a copy of the first issue of apple seed it changed my world uh yeah it just like because that was the first time that i saw tech in, sci in a sci-fi comic that looked like it would work and, and yeah. from that point on, I was like, I am always going to try to engineer the things that I draw. I want my machines to look that real. And uh, and I I really embrace that. So yeah, so I mean, you and I had the same inspirations, basically. Okay. Um, Did you purposely seek to do more uh, sci-fi genre type of art, or was it just? companies were requesting it more from you than than they were looking for fantasy i i think uh i think doing stuff for traveler and art tell story and might have been the only ones that i reached out to first that i cold called essentially um <clears throat> but um i started getting better uh my art improved so fast over the course of like two years uh and i think after like my second or third Talsorian book, maybe, uh, then someone called me from FASA uh, and uh, try wanted to try me out on Renegade Legion, uh, and I and and yeah, someone people always called me. West End Games called me. Uh, as an aside, I I do love that uh, I am the person who drew an Ewok 
X-Wing pilot that has since become canon uh, <laughs> and that George Lucas has that drawing in a box somewhere at the ranch. Really? I, I, I was I was looking at that caption on your uh, Deviant page today and I was like, that's pretty cool. I actually meant to bring that up, but you beat me to it. <laughs> oh, so, sorry. so he has an original piece of art from you? Well, he got all the art. Oh. All the all the finished art for it's the, every other company gave you back your art. You you'd ship it to them, they'd scan it and send it back. Um, <clears throat> but obvious stuff we don't need to worry about today. But we're talking the nineties. Um, but uh, but yeah, West End Games kept the originals, and they all went to Lucas uh, afterwards. Wow, that's that's kind of cool in and of itself. I can I can see George doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so those drawings are moldering away in the uh, Indiana Jones warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a very safe place, <laughs> guarded by but, top, uh, but... men. <laughs> top, <laughs> top men. Top <laughs> men. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So to, to go back to to your question originally, like yeah, I I started getting called by by other companies, and and that's generally how it tended to work from then on. Um, but it's, I've always felt a little sad that, uh, cause I, by the time I was doing shadow run stuff, my art kind of, uh, hit its peak. Uh, I really got my stuff together and it was like the best looking art that I had ever done. Um, and I'm sad that I never really got a chance to go back and bring that quality of art to cyberpunk. Did you did you ever face any blowback for working both on Cyberpunk and Shadowrun, being that they were not like so highly competitive? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Well, that's I, every, cool. every because everyone who was working in the game industry, I mean, no one was really making any money. Everyone was doing it out of love. It wasn't a business so much. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so so yeah, no, everybody was very supportive. Uh, that's why you see so many artists on multiple games from multiple companies. Yeah, and and looking at your your Shadowrun illustrations, I mean, the majority of them seems like they could have been used for Cyberpunk. There wasn't a lot of I, the fantasy I elements. Did them. yeah, I did tend to. I leaned into the tech. Um, I liked the fashion, the weird, um, like semi. Native American cyber like the shamanistic stuff. Fashion. Yeah, that 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 particularly uh, Jeff Laubenstein was doing uh, for Shadowrun. That stuff was really cool, and I tried to in- incorporate a lot of that uh, in my drawings. That's that's very cool. I mean, I've I've long held that. Uh, like I I've never I I don't like the Shadowrun system or setting. But I fucking love the art. Like it just—they were great looking books. <laughs> they really, really were. Uh, but good God, don't throw a grenade in that game system. No, <laughs> no. And bring lots of dice, Jesus. Oh man, oh, that was part of what I, I really loved about uh, the original Cyberpunk. It was a simple, elegant system. Uh, and deadly. And, yeah, it and it made you play differently. Uh, I really liked how it was like it was really hard to hit someone, but if you did hit them, they were going down. Yeah, it created an, an entire. Uh, it created a sense of drama that, to this day, I there are only a handful of other games that that create drama from danger on the same level. Yeah, like in D anD D, you can you can't like hold a knife on someone and be considered a threat. You just can't. Like, one stab isn't going to do something. Yeah. Um, whereas in Cyberpunk, it doesn't matter how, how powerful you are, how many battles you've won, you know, you can still get taken out by a 12-year-old with a twenty-two. Yep, yep. And yeah, and if you set up your game right, uh, then, like, your players are going to be nervous when they enter in a room and have to really count heads it's like can we take all these guys down can we exactly. do it without any of us getting whacked i don't know so <laughs> are, are you still gaming today or has that kind of like been yes put off? okay yeah i mean i i haven't that's fucking awesome i haven't done much i mean i i 
play video game RPGs uh, and and tabletop stuff. I haven't done much since COVID, um, but uh, but yeah, I almost everything that I do now is stuff where basically people just kind of build their own rule systems for them to build a very specific campaign to tell a specific story. Uh, these are very very artisanal sorts of games, uh, which are fantastic with the right group of people. Uh, I think uh, I do. Uh, I don't know. You probably have not heard of of them, but one other game that I have played recently, I'm going to plug this. Uh, I don't know when he's going to finally release it, uh, but my friend Torin Atkinson, who is the lead singer of the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets, uh, amongst other things, has an RPG called Ruin Nation that is hopefully going to come out one day soon. And I did a lot of play testing on that, and that was super fun. It's kind of an updated modern version of Gamma World. Oh, okay. Ooh. Sounds interesting. That's that's exciting. Um, yeah, I will definitely have to check that out when it when it when it releases. I hadn't heard of it yet, but that I liked Gamma World. So, oh, there you go. Well, I'm spreading the word. Possibly too far in advance. I don't know. He's been working on it for a long time. <laughs> do you do you do any uh like online type gaming? Uh not really. I mean, uh, not unless Fallout 76 counts. <laughs> uh, no, uh, when COVID hit, uh, I definitely, I, I turned more to like running games online um, mm. because meeting in groups just wasn't safe anymore. We had several yeah. immunocompromised you know, people in the family. Mm. Uh, yeah, I did I a still, little bit of that, but, yeah. uh, but not too much. I am hoping... Uh, now that I finally got, like, this is the first time I got COVID. I managed to get through three and a half years uh, clean. But uh, now that I've had it and multiple vaccinations, I feel a little safer uh, just having having actual in-person gaming now. So we'll see if see if that pans out. Okay. Well, well good luck to all of us. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> know what I was sick with last week, but I... I went to a Tenacious D concert and it rained us out and I was I was sick as a dog all week. I don't know if it was just because I caught a cold or if it was something deeper, but I didn't start feeling well again until Saturday. Yikes. Well, at least you did it for a good band. Yeah, no, I I, I mean, I, I, I was conscious or not conscious enough, but I was aware enough of what was going on for them to play uh, Tribute and Wonder Boy. And then they started doing stuff off the new album, which, you know, as bad a fan as it makes me, I, I just wasn't as into. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only song that I didn't get to hear that I really wanted to was Fucker Gently. And they played that just as we were walking away, like mm -hmm. trying to get to the car. Oh. But it was a great show. Just really, really wet, like torrential downpour. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um just as a side question, do you ever see the movie uh, Office Space? Yep. It's been a lot of years, though. Okay. I don't remember it well. Can, can, <laughs> can you relate to Michael Bolton with Michael Jackson? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> I told a couple of my friends that I was interviewing Mike Jackson, and they're like, Are, did you dig him up? What the hell? <laughs> Yep. Yeah, and when I was doing some research, I, I would imagine that joke gets old after like twenty years ago. Uh, yeah, and when, uh, I, when oh. I was trying to Google you, there's also a, a Mike Jackson from uh, England who's a, a watercolor artist. So it was kind of hard to put in like artist Mike there's, Jackson, it's a and it's really like <laughs> common name is the yeah. problem. Jackson is common. Michael is really common. Um, I think there's like. Like even when I was like a teenager, there were like twenty other, there were twenty Michael Jacksons in the phone book, and a whole bunch of M Jacksons just for my city. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> I know that uh, like ten, fifteen years ago, I discovered you. I, I found you on Deviant Art and was blown away by that. And we had some brief conversations, uh, but I hadn't talked to you in a while. So when I was trying to track you down for the interview, like. Wow, you haven't posted on DeviantArt in like ten years, and followed your 
I, I followed you to like three different sites. And each one was like, oh, I can't find him. Um, so yeah, you were kind of hard to track down, buddy. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I, uh, I, how did you find me in the end? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd like to say, I, I, I want to say it was, uh, it was through steam powered films. Um, but I, I looked at your email address on that and it's not, it's not the same email address that I finally got a hold of you through. So I'm not, I don't quite remember how I tracked you down, but I sure am glad I did. Yeah. And just for our audience, um, you can find uh, Mike's galleries over on DeviantArt. He's uh, Steam Powered Mike J. And also you have yeah. SteamPowered.com or SteamPoweredFilms.com. Yep. And you also have your. Um, Where you can see his most current projects. Yeah. And. Yeah, though, though both of the websites are way out of date. Yeah. But yeah, no, DeviantArt, I, it's, it's tough because I, I tried so hard when I first got my gallery up there to like check in every couple of days and answer every question that everybody asks. <laughs> but at a certain point, I just, it, it started slipping and, and yeah, and then yeah. now I can suddenly turn around and realize, oh, wow, I think it's been a year since I've even checked my messages there. <laughs> that's, that's how I am. Like I used to check it all the time and now i just I, I like once a year like i'll just get on out of curiosity to see what's happening um because it's become overwhelming like there's just so much stuff on there and i was never really much of an artist myself it was just you know my personal game illustrations and uh things like that just but uh i was able to like get a hold of you and a couple of other like uh, artists through that. So, yeah. Um, you guys should definitely check out his gallery on Deviant Art. It is it is a time capsule into the days of black and white illustration in RPG books, which to me were the, were, were the best days. Well, he Don't also get me did... wrong, I love the color art we're seeing yeah. now, but like that was the tits back then. But, but even in it, the 90s... Sorry, but even in the '90s with the BattleTech art, you have had a lot of um, colored illustrations that you did for Tvasa. That's true as well. Yeah, those were that was kind of some of the last stuff that I really did as as a regular game illustrator, doing like the one painted cover from uh, Maximum Tech for BattleTech, um, and yeah, a couple other little bits. It's it was very time consuming and i think my paintings turned out okay but they were never quite as good as like my best black and white drawings always seemed better than my my best paintings i i would have to disagree <laughs> i mean some of your your oh. paintings are just amazing um it, it all, no, no offense, but it almost seems like it was done by a different artist. Um, different artist. Just because I think the line drawings, you had this one kind of uh, style. And I think with your paintings, you had a little bit of that style, but it was definitely something that was different. Um, and just Yeah, well, it was a very -blowing. different process. Because um, <clears throat> I, I can't handle a brush to save my life and back in the day uh, I like Photoshop was all we had but painting in Photoshop was not like it is now it was Stone Age it was it was a terrible terrible tool um, <laughs> so all of those paintings started out as as shaded pencil sketches and then I scan in the, and I do all the shading in black and white, and I'd scan that in, but you could see all the pencil lines. So I would literally go in, I'd color it, I'd lay color over it, and then use the smudge tool to just wiggle over every little, every tiny bit of the picture, and it made it look kind of like it was painted. It looked like brush strokes instead of pencil. Oh, so all those colored illustrations are actually Photoshop created, not they're actually. all Photoshop. Well, pencil scans and then Photoshop. Huh. Uh, but yeah, but it was such a slow, slow process going through something and like just the smudging, smudge, 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 yeah. smudge, smudge. Oh god! 
And, and yeah, I'm sure you were like looking at the time being like, yeah, I'm not going to make any money on this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but that was always kind of, I mean, the, the sad problem was like, you could only afford to do game art part time. Uh, cause you loved it. Right. Cause there or just was never going to be the money to uh, actually, like, you know, live. Yeah. And uh, going on to the, the illustrations and, and game books, um, it seemed like there's a lot of them that, like, compared to today, a lot of the art was never really credited to specific artists. So, you, you know, you had your name at the beginning of the books underneath the credits, but to associate which image was yours versus an other artist that was in the books, because some of your, some of you guys just had very close uh art right styles and and, and line drawings so it, it was hard to figure out which ones were yours which ones were um not well there's almost always a little mj uh on on mine it's pretty it was pretty rare for me to do it sometimes it originally it was in a circle Yep. Uh, I think that's how it was while I was doing those. It eventually changed into a little graphic that I did, uh, a little kind of rectangular shape that's on my later stuff. But yeah, because of, of that, I always did sign. I always did initial my drawings uh, so you could spot them. That said, um, West End Games on the Star Wars books were the only company to ever crop out my signature. Ooh, really <laughs> yeah because i was looking That's, at some uh, of the the even the art talsorian books i i would always look for your little uh initials but on some pieces like especially like the night city book right so the night city book is <coughs> you and huckabout right and huckabout his style is definitely uh different than yours um so you can definitely see which one who, which ones are yours and which one are his um, and oftentimes I saw some that were, I knew were yours that didn't have that MJ. Um, and there's See, one for me, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go. I was going to say for me, uh, because things like the, uh, that night city source book image I was talking about earlier and some of your other large page illustrations that were really busy like that. Uh, I had to basically cross reference one book to another and like, like, like eliminate artists who, who did this oh, piece? Wow. Like, Oh, okay. Well, this looks like this piece from this book. So who are the same artists? And it was, it was kind of exhausting trying to figure out in the early days who did what. Um, yeah. So when I actually found your site, you found your work on deviant art and I was like, I was right. I knew it was this guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you, you and, uh, and, and, and Benjamin Wright, uh, especially, like, seemed to come from this, uh, from a very similar style of, like he said, uh, similar style of art. Like, Benjamin was doing the uh, the full conversion artwork in Chrome 2, and you were doing all the power armor in Maximum Metal. And uh, it just, you guys' work was so fantastic. Like, you really came from that Appleseed, Bubblegum Crisis, like Adam Warren's Dirty Pair. Like, mm -hmm. it, it felt like that. That is such an underrated comic, by the way. Oh, my God, it is. That, like, that it was... Is, oh. To this day, I consider him the only true Western manga artist. At least yeah. of that time. And, um, you know, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. certainly, I, I, I think... His, I, th I think his run of Dirty Pair was probably the best cyberpunk comic that was done uh, for a long, long time. One hundred percent agreed. Like, yeah. The in fact, his Dirty Pair and Jeff Darrow and Frank Miller's Hard Boiled are my two number one cyberpunk comics, Western cyberpunk comics of the nineties. Mm. Nice. Um, and Transmetropolitan by Warren Ellis, because that's just the best book ever of course. written. Of course. Um, but yeah, the, uh, Jeff Darrow's art was a real influence on me. That's he. I loved how clean his stuff was. And while oh, I was Lord. illustrating for Cyberpunk, that's that where that was why I didn't use shading. 
That's why I was doing these clean lines with no shading work. Um, in the end, I finally found a, a style of shading that worked for me, which was what I was doing when I was doing Shadowrun. But, uh, but yeah, Jeff Darrow was a huge influence on me as an artist growing up. Dude, um, that guy is the most <laughs> ADD. Like, I don't know how each piece doesn't drive him insane. And I've met the guy, and he's just this normal little Frenchman. And I just yeah. look at him in awe. Like, how do you... He does like full comics full of art that, you know, would take other people like a year to do a single panel. And I'm just like, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Yeah. And, no, uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah I can a... see in your art that, that, uh, that he is an influence because you get those little bitty details that other, other people wouldn't even bother with. Well, it was, it was a, a full blown world. For me like i wasn't just popping off drawings to fill space in a book these were games that i played these were worlds that i loved and i wanted to play in and build up and explore and uh and yeah that's that's what that's what i loved about it i mean all that truly comes through and i'll say this you more than any of the other artists that worked on the game brought that world to life with these giant like vistas that you yeah. created uh, like my like uh, the shot of the nomad at the first page of of the night city source book just walking down the empty highway trash blowing all around him the skyscrapers off in the distance like you or the or the shot of you know the riot going on um like that, made, those images made the world come alive. The shot in the shopping mall. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. Um, oh, man. Yeah, and I found Ryros and Dunin, by the way. So. Ah, there you go. Ha. Yeah, I was always sliding little, little references, little Easter eggs into my drawings. Again, it was that kind of shit that made me fall in love with the game um because it, it just it hit me on that visceral like this is my jam level like mm -hmm. to the point where you know that's all i did for like 20 years was work on data fortress 2020 and run cyberpunk games i mean it used to be i wouldn't run anything but cyberpunk oh well <clears throat> yeah no you, and, and and your art was a, just a humongous part of that and why i fell in love with the with the game oh well, thank you yeah, so can you tell us a, a little bit about how you got into doing storyboards for Eon Flux and Reboot? Which, by the way, to the audience, those are two very cyberpunk cartoons. You need to see it. I um, mean, Jesus Christ, Eon Flux was like a lot of people's first introduction into what cyberpunk actually was in the in the 90s because they hadn't seen anything like that. It, it, like anime wasn't mainstream yet. And MTV's liquid television was, it was the jam. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, what Peter Chung created with that show was just mind-blowing. Um, I was working at a video game company at the time. Uh, and they were trying to branch out into wider media. They, they seemed to think that they could do more than just video games. And... One of the people who ran the video game company was friends with someone who ran an animation studio in town. I finished up the project that I had been working on shipped uh, and they didn't have any work for me for a few months. Uh, so this guy was like, well, if you can do storyboards, bring them over, bring them over to me. So they loaned me out to this other other company for a few months. And yeah, I got to do storyboards on two episodes of uh, the Ion Flux series uh, and some some other show that I can't even remember what it was. Um, yeah, and then years later, uh, a friend of mine ended up being becoming the uh, assistant to the producer on Reboot. And uh, they were looking for a new production designer and she knew my art. Uh, so uh, they brought me in and I did did a ton of drawing for uh, season three and uh, the IMAX ride film, which I suspect, I think maybe you can find online now, but uh, 
wasn't really a thing that existed for very long. I mean, Reboot is is such an underrated series. It was it was so far ahead of its time when it came out. But if you look at it now, like it, it blends in with whatever's going on. But back then, man, it was just so far ahead of what was happening. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. You also did work on Kim Possible. Um, <clears throat> that's actually just visual effects on the recent Disney movie of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. One of my friends is uh, a a director. I've I've cut some of his films and done a lot of uh, visual effects uh, for him. Uh, but, uh, awesome. Yeah. Zach Leposky and uh, uh, and Adam. Uh, oh my God! Why am I blanking on his last name? That's embarrassing. Because. That's how it happens when you get pressed. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, anyway, Zach, Zach's a good friend. I, I do bits and pieces on lots of his projects when uh, when there's something right for me. And, but, and uh, but yeah, was... I, I guess, yeah, I saw a lot of credits for you from a visual effects um, artist. Uh, and that's when you kind of made the transition back in the early 2000s, I assume. Yeah, visual effects came a little later, oddly enough. It's like I I taught myself to edit, um, to make my own films, and pretty quickly after that started, turned out I was good enough at it that I started editing for other people. Um, and that turned into a, uh, into a career. Um, and... Uh, I also started learn taught myself visual effects so I could do visual effects for my own things. And after a while, friends started like Zach called me. I was like, I you you could do visual effects. We don't need some big house in LA that's gonna cost a million dollars. You could just do the visual effects for this. And uh and I ended up doing like yeah, huge amounts of visual effects stuff for uh a Disney uh uh Disney uh True. Oh, pardon me. A uh, kids' TV show called Mech X Four that Zach was uh, one of the showrunners on, um, and uh, and yeah, since then, it's funny. It's kind of been back and forth. Some years I make more money doing visual effects. Some years I make more money editing. Yeah. This has been an editing year. Last year was a visual effects year. Dude, I saw Mech X Four. That was that was really cool. Oh. Wow. Almost every time his eyes do the weird flashy effect to control technology, that was me. <laughs> that's that's fucking awesome. Now I can pinpoint that. Yeah. <laughs> we have a, a question from the chat uh, from PW Binde. Um, he asks if, as you consider getting a Discord, so that way you know fans can reach out to you and you can answer fans uh, directly. Not sure if you want to. Just a thought, um, I think, was a uh, his thing or a suggestion, as it were. Yeah, I. I'm I'm not a huge fan of Discord, and I've basically only I used it for for one role playing game, and for, uh, two interviews like this, um, but other than that, I don't really, I don't really know the program. Right. Um, I'm generally not a huge social media guy. Um, I, I'm I'm on Facebook, and uh, I don't hide who I am there. Um, I'm pretty easy to find, uh, and I suppose I do need to actually start making an effort to visit my Deviant Art page. Uh, for a couple of years there, that was probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. <coughs> Got it. Did you ever uh, game with any of the Artesorian crew? Like either I were, went to a con or um, just hang out. Sadly, no. I never met any of them in person. I never met anybody in person that I worked with in the game industry. Really? Over the course of like uh, 12 years of, of game illustrations or whatever it was. Because we're all, <clears throat> we were all in different cities. Right. Um, and I, I never went to Gen Con. Uh, looking back, I don't know why, um, but uh, but yeah, I had phone conversations, and that was actually that was literally all the communication. Um, no one had email, or rather, very few people were using email 
when yep. when I started illustrating. So it was phone calls. That was it. Yeah, back in the nineties, we you barely you, uh... had emails, and then you had what ICQ. I think was another way in which you could talk to people. <laughs> ICQ. <laughs> Yeah. Five seven three zero two zero two. That's that's my ICQ number. I still remember that. I don't remember my phone numbers, but I remember that shit. Nice. But yeah, but it was so hard to to have community back then. It wasn't like like now. Like I have somewhere. I've got a box of fan letters from the late eighties through the the nineties. Because um, yeah, that was the that was the only way people would contact you uh it was the only way they could so earlier you mentioned that you were disappointed with your art in maximum metal which just blows my mind because it was so fucking it was so good like it everything you drew looked like it would work like it was i mean you even went back and redid the av9 from chromebook one uh which i always thought was no offense to that artist, like his brushwork is is really cool, but it it just wasn't it wasn't right for tech. Mm. And your AB9 is amazing. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm glad you like them. I mean, I <clears throat> I just I I looked at that book and all of that collection, and I can tell that I was rushed. Uh, I feel like a lot of the drawings weren't didn't feel very inspired uh yeah some of them were uh some of them came did come together really nicely but it really i was just like i i got super busy with i think i was still at university um and kept pushing it off and pushing it off and suddenly my deadline was a week away and i had like 15 or 20 drawings to do and <laughs> it shows it shows and those drawings would look so much better inked and there was just no time for it um and it was my own fault it was my own stupid stupid mistake and bad planning <clears throat> but but yeah if i had been able to put the time into it that it deserved uh they i think more of the drawings would have been more interesting and more of the designs would have been more interesting and they all would have been nice and inked <laughs> Yeah. So I mean, you say that, but it's just it, it's like the powered armor designs are so fucking gorgeous. Uh, I don't think I did the powered armor designs. Oh. Uh, well, then in that case, my apologies. I, it, it, <laughs> yeah. It looks whoever did them. But they are great designs. I, I think that was you know, um, the the thing is you know there was three interior artists for that supplement. And, you know, it was you, uh, Malcolm Hugh, and Gary Washington. Again, they're looking at, like, even the, the front page with the battle scene of, like, all the AVs, the helicopters, the tanks, the ACPEAs, um, and just these explosions going off. Kind of reminiscent of your work, but I also see, like, some details that make me question... Is it Mike or is yeah, it that, that's, other artists? That's that's not mine, no. Yeah. But I definitely Yeah. For, I mean for, it, it, it for, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> for for someone <laughs> unschooled and and you know doesn't have an eye for like the minor details that you know, oh, I can see, you know, your line work does it a certain way versus someone else's line work. It's similar, but yeah. you can see the different line work. And I think people who, who don't have that eye will often get confused. And I think that's why I asked the question of like, you know, <clears throat> again, the, the artist not always attributing themselves or never putting their signature on their piece of art um, mm. really got some confusion yeah. on, okay, who's this? You know, I, I think it's him, I mean, but I don't know. <laughs> Because of your other like big vista scenes like that, for thirty years, I was sure that big battle scene uh, was you. I, I guess, I, I guess that's Michael He. I don't know. I, but, I guess you have the wrong guest. Uh, I'll show <laughs> no, no, I definitely do not have the wrong guest. I just had been in my head misattributing the art, and that's that, that, it's happened to me but before. I, think, I 
Mike, with I, you uh, saying I that thought... it's pen or pencil work that you've done, that I can see yeah. now the differences between pen, the pencil work that was done in this book versus the the line work and the and the pen work that other the other two artists might have done. Yeah. Uh, now that you're pointing it out, I can see it, but it still just looks fantastic to me. <laughs> well, I'm glad you like it. Um, uh, so it's funny. You mentioned challenge magazine earlier. Uh, cause I think I did some of my best cyberpunk drawings for challenge magazine. I will agree with that. And it, 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 it hurts my heart that most people didn't get to see that because challenge magazine wasn't widely distributed. Like I didn't find out that they did cyberpunk articles until well after like challenge magazine was dead. Oh, wow. Uh, and to see some of the art pieces that you created for that magazine and know that that's the only place that they ever appeared. It just breaks my heart that most people don't get to see that. Well, they are on in my art gallery on David Art. They are, they are. So everybody should go check that out because it's definitely worth it. And it has a rendition of the bozos, which a lot of people do love. Yeah, doing bozo shit. <laughs> that that drawing was a lot of fun. Um, so um, how many... I also like the the one where the team is. Uh, I think you call it Aloha. Yeah where the team is has just disembarked from the AV and oh it's just it's just fantastic mm -hmm. it's something that i would love to have as a poster in my room oh thank you that's actually one of the few pieces i don't still own uh years ago now god it's probably like 15 years 20 years maybe a fan reached out wanting to buy it to put on the wall of his gaming club so i sold him the original and shipped it across the country oh man i mean have you thought about it is beautiful uh prints of any of these and, and posting them on your website um i've thought about it um the and i should probably look at it again i've been totally consumed with working on my feature for the last several years and it hasn't left a lot of between that and day jobs it hasn't left a lot of time for that but i should look into it again and what i do i have a almost complete art book uh, oh that i mean and it's just like vanity prints uh press uh print on demand kind of thing but i just before covid i spent a lot of time and i i put together an art book uh of everything i'd done up until that point um and with lots of lots of the art and talking about the art and things like that and it is still my intention to put that out uh not that certainly won't be this year um, but that is something I want to do. I want to update what I put together with, uh, some more recent art that I've done. Um, oh Lord, I most definitely want a copy of this. <laughs> All right. So, so you and I would definitely, two buyers. I don't know if I could afford them, but I definitely would want prints, uh, of your, of several of your pieces. Oh, wow. Well, we should, uh, continue this conversation, uh, electronically afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but certainly it is, it is my intention. I have a book basically written, put together. Uh, it just needs to, I would need to finish it and throw, get a proof to make sure it actually prints correctly. And then it can be available on demand in theory. Yeah. Just an oh, F yes. FYI, um, I kind of have a, a film strip playing in our Twitch channel right now. Of the various pieces you've done from Battletech, uh, Shadowrun, Torg, all the illustrations you've done over the years, um, not all of them are there, but a good, a good sampling of your work. So our audience has the ability to see some of the pieces that you've worked on. Um, so speaking of your pieces, which one do you do, are you most proud of? Oh, cool. Do you have like huh. one that you love the most or is it I, all I, your children and so you don't have I a favorite? I do have a couple of favorites. 
I do I do have a, a, a few favorites. Uh they're which are on my wall right now. Um <laughs> the I mean they're not from Cyberpunk. Um because my, my art got so much better uh after my early Cyberpunk books. But there's a battletech drawing that I did uh of a female mech pilot uh shivering in the snow with a, a smashed marauder behind her. Yes. Ooh, that is a good one. That that's one of my my all-time favorites. Um I did a uh, a couple of wild uh cyberspace drawings for Shadowrun that that turned out particularly well. Um a, uh, actually, and now I'm blanking, you mentioned uh, it, the most recent game company that I did stuff for, but it's still a long ways, a long time ago now. Um, Torque? Yeah. Oh, no. No, there was something that it, the Jeff Laubenstein had moved on to be the art director, or sorry, not him, Jim Nelson, who was the art director uh, at, on, at FASA was working at another game company in the early aughts. Oh, was that and, the uh, XP or something like that? Uh, no, something else. And I can't remember the, the name. Um, I'd have to go look at my, my bookshelves because the publishers always send me copies of the books. Anyway, I did some just straight up pencil, fully shaded, because now by then you could actually reproduce them properly in a book. And I did a whole bunch of fantasy illustrations uh that were full pencil and a couple of those turned out super nice um the the harp i'm your elf maiden maiden harp that was that was it okay um but oddly enough my favorite most recent favorite one isn't online yet uh because the project uh has never officially been announced or released uh but i did a flying uh, robot space city, just a big drawing of this 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 weird retro sci-fi flying city. Um, uh, I did that last year. Uh, huge drawing in Photoshop, full color. Uh, took like a week, uh, and that turned out great. And I look forward to the day when I can actually release it online because I think it, that's definitely some of my best. Nice. Um, yeah, there, there's uh, one piece I those saw. Those are all here. fantastic pieces. I can't wait to see the one you're talking about now. Yeah, there's one piece um, called Choppers uh, from Shadowrun that I, I've never seen before, but it's basically an image of, uh, I, I don't know what they were called in Shadowrun, but an edge runner jumping out of a helicopter with a katana attacking like these people who are out on a, a balcony sunning. Mm. Um, and just Yeah, that's such a good piece. I, oh, thank you. I've actually had a uh, game in which something very similar uh, took place. However, it was the reverse in which uh, one of the solo characters was jumping up at an AV and jumping in through the door with a katana. Um, huh, nice. <laughs> I, I think well, I think my favorite of your Shadowrun pieces is Car Chase. Oh. Like it, there's yeah. so much going on in that one, and it's so dynamic. Like, that one came together really, really well. Uh, yeah, like it's very happy it's, with that. It's straight like, like I want to read the rest of that story. I want to see that illustrated. I want to see, I want to see a comic book with that that scene in it. <laughs> well, and that's that's what I always tried to do. And I know that that's something that set me apart from a lot of the other artists at the time. So many they just kind of draw someone posing, or a couple of yeah. people posing, or whatever. But I always tried to build a scenario and and have this is a, a snapshot of a moment in the middle of something bigger yep and and i always yeah i tried tried to make them rich with story um yeah i was gonna like, say is, is, oh sorry <clears throat> no go ahead go ahead go ahead no I, I was just gonna say about regarding choppers um that is one of the there was a tiny a little stretch of time when i was trying uh, I don't know if you're looking at the at it right now, but you may notice the cross hatching is different. The mm -hmm. my shading, and and I I did a brief bit of experimenting with something called duo shade paper, um, where you would basically you draw on it like normal, 
uh, but to create the shading, there were these two different chemicals that you would paint on it. And if you painted on with one of them, it only brought out one set of lines. And if you painted with the other, it brought out both sets of lines. Oh, interesting. Ooh. And it looked so cool when it was finished. It was like, yeah, at the time it was like, man, this is, this is the best thing I've ever done. And it didn't reproduce well in the book. It's, it's muddy uh, in the actual book. It's a little hard to read. And over the years, turns out that that, uh, that duo shade paper is garbage. And it all turned yellow, and the faint lines are almost gone. They've totally disappeared and faded out. Um, so it just looks, the original just looks like garbage now. Uh, so the version that's on DeviantArt, um, I had to scan my original twice with different methodologies and mix it with the a scan of the print from the book. And between the three, I was able to, and a lot of Photoshop work, I was able to clean it up and make it look like it looks online now. But, uh, but man, it was, it was heartbreaking to open up the drawer and discover that the drawing just looks like garbage now. Yeah, I, I can imagine, but still, what a, what a great image. Um, I, I feel bad for the hardships that you have endured with it, but I mean, no. that's, that's the price of art. It, if it were easy, everybody would do it. True enough. Enough. So you took a, a stab at um, web comics with a, a part Mugeddon. Yeah. Um, you ever think of going back to that, or you, you kind of moved on to bigger and better things? Um, I I've mostly moved on. I'd in theory I'd like to finish it, but if I'm being realistic, I'm I don't know if I ever will. Um, it was based on a uh, a short film script that I wrote. Um, that was too expensive to film. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if it will... I don't know if I'll ever get some version of that story out or not. Um, comics were tough for me. And, and when, before we, we went, went on air, uh, as it were we, were, we talked a little bit about comics because that's been a weird thing in my life because I, when I was a kid... Being a comic book artist was all I ever wanted in the world. That was my dream. I was going to be a comic book artist. And I worked and I drew every day and worked hard at it. And I drew my own comics and I steadily got better and better. And I was even still trying while I was doing my earliest illustrations for Cyberpunk. Um, and I'd sent sample pages to Marvel and DC uh, and Dark Horse, I think. And DC actually got back to me saying... Uh, all right, you didn't draw any superheroes. You only drew like the cyber stuff. Yeah. Um, can you, uh, here's, here's a script page, draw us a comic page. And I hated it. And the page turned out mediocre and it took me a long time. And I was like, okay, superhero comics, I definitely won't do, but I still, I can do sci, there are sci-fi comics now. I can be a sci-fi comic guy. I'll write them and draw them. It's going to be amazing. And that same video game company I was working at that wanted to branch out into other media, um, they, one of them was comics. So they gave me, I'd come up with a game concept. So they had one team that was working on the game and it never, never came to fruition. Um, and I was working, making the comic for it. And I discovered that I, it's just not in me. Um, I'm slow and you have to be able to do a page a day if you want to make rent yep. and my fastest speed putting out mediocre work because I'm drawing too fast was a page every two days uh, and I also always struggled with it and I guess the problem is the nice thing with role-playing game art was you never had to draw the same person twice That's true. but in comics you do 
You have to draw that same face again and again and again, and it has to look like the same person every time, every angle. And I sucked at that. Well, so, I mean, for the record, I would have bought anything you put out. That's, <laughs> I mean, no, no shame, no, no, no hesitation. Anything you put out, I would have bought. I would mm -hmm. think that um, storyboards would even be. Well, granted, storyboards aren't necessarily as detailed as comics, but the the you still need to generate it, a lot, right, in a, in a short period of time. Yes, yes, and that's why I don't do storyboard art. I occasionally <laughs> do storyboards, but I don't do it often because uh, even at yeah at the the super rough speed uh, quality you can get away with, it's still slow, and I get bored to tears. Um, and and it takes forever, or feels like it takes forever. Um, and one of the the odd things about my art, and I don't know if this would have changed if I'd illust if I'd stuck with illustrating longer, because um, I basically I I was drawing all day, uh, most days for like fifteen years, uh, when all said and done, um, but it was always hard. Um, and it always took time. I'd have to use a lot of references from people. My, my art really... Everything I drew for Cyberpunk never had references. Almost everything I did for Cyberpunk, I was having people pose for me so I could double-check things like, oh, how do the folds and the fabric go? Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. How, how does the arm move? Um, yeah. And you don't have time to do that in comics. Um, and... Or at least certainly you didn't then. And when I was at my peak, when I was drawing my very best and my very fastest, I could sometimes get into this zone where I just knew how to draw a person right no matter what. It would just flow out of me like I barely had to think about it, like I almost couldn't draw fast enough. It would just create these shapes and it was a person and it was alive and it had this energy and that was like those moments when they happened those were the times when i could draw well and fast and that was great and i i did a lot of that when i was doing concept art for other for video games for aeon uh, sorry for um oh my god why am i blanking on the name of a, a game called anachronox um a few there's other concept art you might see that that does it uh, in my on my website, but that zone was so hard to hold on to, mm -hmm. and if I didn't fall into that zone, it was just really painstaking, making a face look right, making an arm look right, um, and and it was a slow methodical. My drawing was always a slow methodical process, and I was always and to this day I'm jealous of the artists who can just dash stuff off. They just, it's like the pen is a part of them and they just woof a few scribbles. I went to a Comic-Con in 1991 or 92 and Mobius autographed oh. uh, a copy of the airtight garage for me. And he Ooh. was a drawing in every book for every person. Wow. He took eight seconds. It's like 12 lines and it's magnificent yeah it sounds like mobius yeah <laughs> and in the end that was the big a big reason why i i left illustration as a career uh i i loved it but i wasn't fast enough to be able to go to the places i wanted to go with it um, and maybe that would have changed if I'd stuck with it, but, uh, it, I wouldn't have been able to make rent, uh, yeah. in the intervening years. Yeah. As a grown up. Yeah. And, I, I can see that. And being um, a teenager, I tried to get into art and I think, and I, I, I don't know if this is true for all artists, but for me, the biggest critic was myself. Um, because you're always sitting there looking at someone else and being like, wow, how did they do that? I could never get to that level. Um, and there's always that voice inside your head that, you know, you, you 
you compare yourself to these other artists and they're at a different level, right? Like something like for you, like you picked it up in two mm -hmm. years and, and improved your skill, but people who are starting off will always like, oh man, I don't think I could ever get to that level. Um, but it sounds like you kind of went past that and achieved it through just doing a piece of art every day and improving your craft, which I found well, that is the inspiring thing. It, a it little. It takes time. <laughs> it, it, it's like it's like music, learning to play an instrument. Yep. Uh, if if you've got the innate talent, and not everybody does, but a lot of people do, um, if you've got the ability to kind of to look at a thing and use a lot use lines to make something that looks like that on a computer or on a piece of paper then all it is is practice and and yeah i just i drew all day every day for years and years and years but even that said then like i mean i'm i never considered myself a great artist i considered myself a good artist maybe even very good but there were always people that I would look at, like Mobius, for example, Jeff Darrow, where I'm like, I am nothing compared to them. Right. Well, I mean, I love Jeff Darrow. Don't get me wrong. But uh, sometimes there's so much detail that it, it hurts the overall piece, if that makes any sense. And oh, uh, his, his stuff and, is very specific. <laughs> And some of his uh, some of his people, uh, they the faces come across a little flat because he's focused on everything else. Yeah. So I mean, he's, everybody's amazing though is his gimpiest person looks as good as like it's it looks better than like half of my people. So. I mean, I think your people look great, but that's oh. me. I, I can see where you would self criticize on that. Um but I don't I don't find any flaws in your art. And I understand that, you know, one of your pieces may may take longer than would feasibly, you know, make you money, especially trying to start out uh with a new project as it were, like a comic book or something like that. But I mean, like I said, I would have bought anything you put out. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. It, it's it's funny when you talk about not noticing any of the flaws, it reminds you of something that I actually learned many years ago that was kind of like the, the only way to be successful in an art form is to be in, you have to be in a very specific place for how critical you are of your own work. And if you're not able to spot the flaws. You're uh, you can't get better, so you just keep making the same drawing or playing the, the guitar the same way or whatever. But on the flip side, if you see too many of the flaws, you get disheartened and you give up. Yeah. So everybody who's made it uh, to any level of skill and success, they all were in a zone where they were critical enough to drive themselves to keep getting better and keep trying to improve but not so critical that they were like this is impossible i suck yeah not breaking their own hearts yeah yeah and i i i saw saw artists who were very talented give up because they were just like it's never good enough i hate i hate my drawings they're not good and and so they just stopped drawing and it's like my god if you'd kept drawing you would be one of the best artists around Yes, some people have said that about me, and I was like, "Yeah." But I also had a brother who was a. But you you can't unsee the flaws either. Yeah. It's like if you see them, you see them. And also, my brother was also a good artist. We had definitely had two different styles, but I always envied his style, right? And that's not <laughs> it's not a good mixture. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so. Um. We got about another 30 minutes. So uh, the last question we actually have written, um, and I don't know if you want to comment on this, but um, what is your kind of viewpoints of this whole AI debate with art in the art community? 
Um, do you see it as like a tool going forward or do you see it as uh, kind of like something that's going to like destroy everything and all artists? I don't know how to feel about AI. It's going to destroy a lot. It um, is. It's like the fact is people are now putting out game. I mean, and the the AI art, AI art is. I I have never seen a piece of AI art AI art that is a masterpiece. They can't no. hit that quality bar, but I've seen tons that looks good. Um, but yeah, people are already putting out game books with AI AI art. Um, so that's artists out of work. Right. Straight up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen comic books come out with AI art. Mm. And it's just, like, awful. It's not consistent. It's uh, it's definitely putting... Not only is it putting artists out of work, but it's actively stealing from those artists to create whatever amalgam yes. you end up with. And that's that's not cool. Yeah, it's these weird... these This Franken art... Um, and it's it, but it's it's tough. Like I, this project with the city that I was working on, um, the uh, a guy who uh, whose project it was, he actually used uh, a couple of specialists whose whole new career is generating AI art uh, to get us just like tons and tons and tons of concept art for all kinds of locations in this city because i couldn't churn out art at that speed yeah. and yeah, no and it was it was tough because like i i felt kind of gross about it and nothing was like oh we could just build 3d models of this square and these buildings that's going to be great everything was flawed but there were great ideas all through it yeah. here and where they originally came from, what artists work, did they originally riff from? Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, so we'd kind of go through and be like, okay, this part of this building's good. I like the way this street works. This is a nice causeway. And so we could pick and choose parts we liked. Right. Um, I mean, so that was useful. The, but... the only, the only stopgap, uh, it seems that I'm, uh, the only stopgap it seems is that none of this AI art can can be copyrighted because it's all stolen pieces from from all over the place. If that so, holds legally, and hopefully, yeah, it if that holds legally, and it should, uh, in any sane system, it would. Um, but that's really the the only stopgap I'm seeing with AI art. Uh, yeah, just well, taking over everything. I. I heard something recently i can't remember who, who whether i read it or heard it but it was someone saying that uh whenever they look at a when they look at art they can always see a point of view art every piece of art has a point of view the yeah. artist has put into that piece and when he looks at a ai art there's no point of view and I thought it was a good way of kind of putting how, like, there is, even in some of the most beautiful looking AI art I've seen, there's something weirdly soulless about it. Yeah. I, I, that's, uh, that's a good way to put that. It's, it's very but, much lacking in a focal point, a, a, any type of unified, like, it just doesn't feel like somebody created it. It yeah. feels artificial. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess the, the best way to put it, comparing it with, because you were talking about like those drawings that I have with the deep background with so much going on, and everything going on comes from the same point of view and is all yeah. fit together. All the 20, 30 people in that crowd and every street sign. It's, it's, it's all, all one perspective. Yeah. And... And certainly AI art does not do that. One corner of an AI painting doesn't necessarily match another corner. Um, they look no. pretty together, but they're not. But where AI is hitting 
me direct more directly in career now is actually in visual effects. Mm. They've been making leaps and bounds in the last six months in it. And it is going to eliminate 75% of visual effects jobs. Wow. Yeah, it's it's tragic. I mean, it's getting to the point where it's going to eliminate all the jobs. Well, yeah, um, yeah. At that point, it's just going to be the only jobs will be be a corporate exec and or being a chef for a corporate exec. Um, but but no, in, in seriousness, it's like I mean, the the tough thing in visual effects is it is in visual effects. It's displacing going to displace jobs, but it's not stealing in the same way. That that isn't really the problem. Um, and it's not necessarily a problem, except that I make money doing visual effects a lot, but like, uh, AI is not going to do cool ass laser beams or a weird effect with like gravity, some sort of a gravity sphere or like and big sci-fi stuff. AI is never going to do. AI yeah, it's is never going to be able to innovate. It's never going to be able to show us something new. Yeah. It's not going to be able to create the graphical displays on the enterprise. Um, but what it does, what it, it's just starting to be able to do badly now and is going to be able to do fantastically inside of a year is remove boom lights, change the color of the sky or the cloud patterns in the sky, move a yeah. car, change the color of a car, all of those sorts of re remove reflections of the crew from mirrors. That's the sort of work. It's not glamorous. <clears throat> But it's the bulk of visual effects paid jobs. Right. And and one person good with the AI tools will now be able to crank that stuff out uh, at a rate that would have taken ten artists. Yeah, and yeah. I think I mean it, it's 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 moving even faster than the progression from uh uh like VFX kind of in a lot of ways um eliminated practical effects. Or at least, like, lessened them by quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and and now AI is going to do the same thing to VFX. And just as they're truly getting fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, the worst example... I think in the end... Sorry. The, the worst example I oh. saw was there was... Um, and I forget which game supplement it was that just recently came out within the past six months. Um... I saw a debate from, I've, and, not, and again, I don't remember if it was on Discord or Reddit or somewhere, in which the one of the users was saying, I can't believe they used all this AI art. And I was like, how do you know it's AI art? Well, because it looks exactly like all this other AI art that people have put out. Well, how do you know it's not the artist <laughs> that AI stole from that now is you're considering yeah. AI art because the AI stole it, made it its own, well, kind of made it its own, and you were only getting exposed to that style of art because you went to, you, you seeing all this AI art and you just make the assumption. So even that, like, mm. to the, your point of stealing it, now people are saying, well, this artist stole it from AI art, you know, when the reality is, no, the AI art really stole it from me and now it's so widely used mm -hmm. especially like um cyberpunk ai art uh if you go onto like any of the discords or reddits it's all kind of the same kind of look of this purple pink shading um and very similar mm. which people are always suing oh well, that's ai art well no <laughs> there was an artist who did for me that like and... the main the main giveaway is with the AR, AI art, none of the tech makes any sense. Like at first glance, it may look cool, but if you look deeper and try to make any sense of what's happening, like there, there's nothing to be had. It's, yeah, there, there's, there's no ground rules underneath. There's no story behind yeah. it. And uh, like, yeah, it's, it's the antithesis of my art. Yeah, there, there, just nothing does anything. It's yeah. just there. Uh yeah, even that just, and, you know, everybody having like 12 fingers on their hand. And stuff. Oh, man. Yeah. It's. Yeah. Yeah. Although mm -hmm. I am glad to know that even computers find hands impossible to draw. 
loss. But, but. <laughs> Hands are not easy. Hands are not easy. Um, I I got good at them, but it took a long time. Feet still give me trouble. Yeah, I mean, they're just such weird shapes, and they do weird things. But here's the point, or here's the thing. If Rob Liefeld can make it, anybody can. <laughs> Oh. I'm, I'm never not going to dig on Rob. Sorry. He's a nice enough guy, but. <laughs> he, he isn't on my list of all time favorite comic book artists, but that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I was going to say the, the last thing I would say about AI is here's where I think it's going to end because I'm seeing a lot of things <clears throat> that remind me of, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the desktop publishing revolution oh yeah i definitely remember that yeah so because that's the thing it's like the tools came out suddenly anybody with a computer could do their own pub printing and publishing and make their own flyers and make their own menus and make their own books and they all and their own posters and they were all like we don't need to hire artists anymore i'll just get my grandson to do it for me and it all uh, <laughs> and there was there was a few years there where you were, if you were not a great graphic artist, grandma with the computer was now better than you and you lost your job. Yeah. But, yeah. There was a, there was a whole generation of like the worst graphic design imaginable because nobody wanted to pay anybody who knew what they were doing. Yeah. So, and that was a rough stretch. Um, but at the end of the day, basically, it settled down to a place where really talented professionals were still the best place to go. Uh, oh, yeah. And they kept working. They never stopped working. But it basically got rid of the lowest level of the jobs. The shitty jobs that paid garbage vanished. And the shitty yeah, kind of swept more clean. Yeah. Um, and so I, my hope is that's where AI is going to end. That the pe powers that be all the, because people will just splew it over everything now and use AI solutions on everything. And a lot of them will fail and some of them will stick. But the ones that will stick will be the ones that are actually as good as a mediocre human. But nothing worse than that. Uh, and everybody who is better than mediocre will still have jobs. That that would probably be the best case scenario, yeah. Because I mean, it's it's the Pandora has opened the box. The cat's out of the bag. Like AI, AI art isn't going anywhere. Uh, but, but if if people can recognize the difference between this mass-produced soulless stuff and it. It eliminates, you know, some of that bottom tier of, of people who I don't want to say lack the talent or lack the heart, but yeah, people the the people who shouldn't probably be doing that for a living in the first place. While allowing the people who should be doing it uh uh their space. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is certainly that's the hope. Um, it, it, it's funny. I, the go ahead. Oh no, I, I was I was just gonna say, uh, my uh, my friend Zach Leposky, uh, currently I believe working on. He and Adam are directing the new Final Destination movie. Um, but uh, right. he he was like when I talked to him about AI a couple months back, he was like, "No, you're thinking about it all wrong. It's great." You know all those people you need to, to hire to make a movie? You won't need to do that anymore. You could just make your movie all on your own. It'll be fantastic. Oh, man. I don't he, know if that's... Was, a... He was being, being a little sarcastic, but... Uh, I was going to say, that's... that's in, in the days of the SAG after strikes, that's... that's... Well, no, that, was, <laughs> I don't... that was pre strike. That was pre... Oh, my God. Yeah, okay. So this is going on. I'm going to make it very clear. This was pre strike. And he was he wasn't talking about he's not a studio exec, he's a creative. Um he's yeah, a yeah, no, I, brilliant guy. Yeah. Um but 
but yeah, no, it's, um, I need to choose my words very carefully, or maybe you should make sure this, the rest of this doesn't, <laughs> this whole section goes out of a, any podcast recordings. Um, cause yeah, no, he just, just like me, he started out as just this young, excited, creative person who was into sci-fi and just wanted to tell stories. And trying to do that for a living is so hard. Yeah, absolutely. And You're not going to get any judgment from me out of it. Huh? Yeah, I, and I mean, making my feature has been so hard. And it's taken so much work from so many people. And in the world of dreams, in some ways, wouldn't it be nice if I could just walk down to my computer, build my ideas, and see a film come out? That would be amazing. Yeah. As an artist, that would be amazing. Do I want a studio executive to have that power? No, not no. No. Uh, and, I mean, artists fact, are going to create uh, art, and they're going to use the tools that are available to to them to do so. And I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like try and limit that. But yeah, studio executives, uh, the money men who have no real creative vision but want to stick their dirty fucking fingers in everything. Yeah, screw those guys. Well, I I prefer to be a little more polite to them because at the end of the day, some of them pay my paycheck. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're uh, you're you're in the business. I I am not. I apologize. The the challenge there is simply that they're not creatives, and whereas twenty years ago, all the studios were run by people who loved movies and were into it because they yeah. loved movies. Uh, Everyone who runs the studios now went to business school. And they're the business truth. guys. And it's about payment. It's about making money. It's about uh, shareholder dividends. It's about all this kind of this artless business. And that's challenging. Uh, yeah, everything's everything's created by algorithm. Like, what, what notes can we hit on this to... to bring in just the maximum number of paying moviegoers. They thankfully haven't quite gotten that bad, but uh, but who knows? Who knows? Certainly it's it was a lot easier uh, back when the people who paid to make movies also loved movies. Truth. Uh, and 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 when they really cared about the awards too like because a lot of for a lot of them as as businesses it's like yeah i still need to make more like 10 more million dollars than that studio this year uh but uh at least we got an oscar for this thing there were always a few things that they'd be because of because of the love of of movies there'd still be like yeah they didn't just want to say we made x dollars this year aren't i great they want to be able to say we did this movie that won 10 Academy Awards and this movie that won five Academy Awards. And... Well, I mean, even, even in the most, even in the largest studios with the most heavily criticized works, uh, like franchises and whatnot, there are still like some beacons of hope of this level of creativity. Uh, Dave Filoni on his Star Wars projects. Jesus Christ, that's... He's creating the Star Wars that I've wanted to see since 1983. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I had some, some issues with some of his stuff, but overall, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there's all, you're going to be able to criticize everything that you love. There's going to be certain aspects that are like, man, I wish they'd done it differently. But uh, overall, I've, I've loved everything he's done. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, no, there's, there's lots of. There are so many talented, creative people out there working hard every day, uh, making great stuff. Um, I, I do want to um, circle circle back and just kind of really clear, like like yeah, to go go back to just like the Zach's thing and just the idea of like being able to make a movie on your own and and that being oh, kind yeah. of a, a pie in the sky dream, because. What's interesting is when I think about it, give it a little more thought afterwards, like that that dream scenario does appeal to the little kid inside me. But oh, absolutely. the thing that it forgets is 
Working with actors is amazing. Working with a group of people is amazing. When you've got the right group of people and they're all talented and everybody's bringing a different point of view and everybody's bringing new ideas, the richness and stuff. Like if I got to make a version, make a movie once with just me and a computer and make the same movie with a crew and a big creative team and a lot of talented actors, that version is going to be way better, hands down. Ever. I mean, it's the truth. Uh, uh, like, here's the deal. A bad movie made by people who love it is still going to be better than a good movie, like a well-directed, well, well-written, well-shot, but made with people who can't stand it. Don't other. really care. Yeah. I mean, the best examples I can give of this are like the low-budget horror movies of the '80s. Mm -hmm. like, they're, they're awful movies, but Jesus Christ, they're fantastic to watch. Yep. Things like Toxic Avenger. I mean, low budget as hell in like just silly ass plots. But everybody involved in those early trauma films loved it. They were passionate about it. And we're it made entertained. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and if, if you get a bunch of people who aren't into it, you you get stuff like the the twelfth Friday the Thirteenth movie, which mm. just nobody cares about. Nobody remembers that crap. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, so passion passion makes the art. Like oh, you oh, gotta always. be excited about what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We're about almost at time, so I guess the last question is: Do you have any questions for us? Um, I don't know little voices coming out of my computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and obviously, I guess <clears throat> you guys are both obviously people who really love these games. Yeah. Which is great. because yeah, yeah, You, you right? can say that. We never really talked about Cyberpunk 2077, which I freaking loved. Uh, I thought it got a lot of bad press at the start that was unfair. Uh, One hundred percent agree. Like it, it yes, it was garbage on the X, the the Xbox. But uh, I, I'm a PC gamer, and even right out of right out of the gate, it performed decently enough, looked gorgeous, and that that game has some of the best storytelling uh, and character. Oh, it's in my top three of all time. I've ever experienced in a game. Like Cyberpunk 2077, story wise, is up there with Red Dead Redemption 2 and The Last of Us. Like, it is such a phenomenal story. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and well told. Um, I've just started yeah. playing Starfield and I'm immediately dis disappointed with it because I feel like all of the new things that Cyberpunk 2077 brought to video game RPGs are just left in the dust and it's back to like you're sitting in cars talking to characters in cyberpunk 2077 and it, they feel like real characters yeah they're, they're real people i mean jesus christ they look like real people yeah i mean it's it's still a little uncanny valley but they're they're people they're characters they're alive yeah. and Back to in Starfield, it's right back to a staring contest with mannequins. It's like, oh my god, have you guys yeah, loved the, nothing? As gorgeous as it is, it's still Bethesda. Yeah, and I, I'm a I I a longtime lover of Bethesda games. The Fallout series oh, is my all-time favorite game series. But uh, but man, like with the number of years it took them to put that game out. I was really surprised at how few mechanics had been improved. It's still using uh, janky old animations from Skyrim for like running and jumping and stuff. And the That's, sitting animation, the sitting pose is the same. Like, in, in my opinion, that's because it's primarily programmed, like the, the Bethesda game engine is primarily programmed to be done in first person perspective. And anytime you do that, like if, it, it, the character movements just look weird and stiff and because you can be looking in one direction and running full speed in another it 
just looks weird as hell. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, yeah. That's that's a special issue trying to deal deal with that. I mean, yeah, they they use a different model for your POV for first person and third person, uh, which Cyberpunk didn't do. Um, you can square that circle, though. Um, I just, even though it's a game that's a few years old, I just finished playing Control recently. And when I got an RT, a new RTX card in and enabled all the reflections, holy crap, that game <laughs> actually, I mean, it's all third person, but, like, you see your reflections in mirrors and, in, and reflecting in windows, and it looks believable, and the animation all works. Yeah. There's got to be a way to square that circle. Yeah. Um, I mean, GTA, uh, GTA Online, you can switch, like, it's, it, it's programmed in third person, but you can switch to first person. You can always tell who's running around in first person because that's the way yeah. games work. I, I really but, uh, hate But, yeah, to, it's uh, gotten to the point with ray tracing and all that. You can see reflections, and it's amazing. Uh, yeah. really but at the same time, like, it really pulls it back in like starfield where it's still using the same crappy old animation that the yeah. artist did 15 years ago that's I, like just do some new animations uh i hate to be that guy but we are technically at time um and it sounds like we could probably have another hour conversation around uh cyberpunk 27 oh, probably couldn't take the, it so and, and the game um my yeah we'd love Definitely to have you talking about 27 so. yeah we'd love to have you back and maybe continue this conversation after phantom liberty drops um we we will try to work with your schedule to figure out something if you're if you're interested um and continue this sure. conversation because we we'd love to have you back uh but yeah <laughs> absolutely uh you you along with several other of our guests now have an open invitation to join us whenever you like uh you, anytime that your schedule opens up and you want to talk about cyberpunk in a public forum you just let us know and we'll add you to the show yep and well, we'll schedule right. thank you on. so much so, um thank you yeah so first off i would like to thank you for joining us um it was great talking to you I, I, absolutely I, again big fans of your art um i didn't realize how much battletech you did um i was a big fan of battletech and i'm like looking at your pieces and we're like wow um he did that so it's definitely a <laughs> pleasure for me to uh have this conversation with you uh so we know deviant arts um awesome. steam powered mike j you can find him there you also have uh steam powered films.com uh any other places that people can come and check you out uh i think probably deviant art is the best one right now uh so i guess i better start checking my messages there <laughs> hopefully uh, uh he's also on facebook at steam powered films there yep uh just to throw that out there um yeah, yeah thank you mike so much for showing up Gen yeah. uh ladies and gentlemen mike jackson yeah. um and Mike, if you need to, it's been just fantastic talking. Take off, you can, um, but we're just going to close the show. If you want to still hang out, and we'll talk a little bit after the show, you know, it's up to you. But we, sure. we... I'm, I'm going to mute my mic while I get a glass of water. Excellent. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. All right. All right. Thank you for listening, folks. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending tonight. Um, I thought that was a great show from a great person. Um, so. All right, I'm Indeed. Cyber Smiley. Uh, you can check me out at uh, cybersmiley.net. That's without uh, an E at the end of the s smiley. Um, I also have a, a Discord uh, that's linked into from my site. I'm also on various other Discords. So if you do like at Smiley or at Cyber Smiley, good chance I, I will be, <coughs> be targeting. Um, also, I roam on the various reddits that are out there for cyberpunk whether it's 2020 red or even uh some of the 2077 uh discord servers as well as uh the reddit places wisdom 
I am Wisdom, otherwise uh, Wisdom Triple Zero, otherwise known as Derek Vernier. I run Data Fortress 2020 and have since 1996. It is the largest, most comprehensive Cyberpunk 2020 site you'll find. Uh, I am available on Facebook, both at the Data Fortress 2020 group and the Cyberpunk 2020 group. I uh, lurk at the Cyberpunk 2020 and Red and 2077 and other groups on Reddit. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. It's just too much work. Um, but yeah, anything you guys want to reach out and get a hold of us for, comments, criticism, complaints, suggestions, uh, please do so. We love hearing from you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, like that. We are. We'd like to thank uh, Rob Mulligan and Cybernation Uncensored for hosting us. Yep. Uh, we have shows every first and third Wednesday of the month. And you can find us, you can find our old shows on the Tales from the Forlorn Dopes uh, playlist on the Cybernation Uncensored YouTube channel. And also, uh, Cybernation Uncensored has Yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank well. you, Mike Jackson, for uh, talking with us today. And see you next time. Absolutely. You guys have a great night.